The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of severe vision loss in people over age 60. Find out more about eye health tonight on Health Connections. for joining us on Health Connections. I'm your host, Stacy Beecham. Tonight our guest is Dr. Middlebrook, a local optometrist here in Austin, Minnesota. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of severe vision loss in people over age 60. It occurs when the small central portion of the retina, known as the macula, deteriorates. The retina is the light-sensing nerve tissue at the back of the eye. Because the disease develops as a person ages, it is often referred to as age-related macular degeneration. Tell us a little more about age-related macular degeneration. Well, Stacy, there are two main types of age-related macular degeneration. I think from here on we should probably try to just refer to it as AMD for the sake of uh, expediting the conversation. Okay. But uh, the two main types are dry and wet. And the main differences between these two types are the method by which vision is lost and also the relative incidence of severe vision loss. Let's start with dry macular degeneration. This occurs when light-sensitive cells in the macula begin to break down slowly over time, eventually leading to blurred vision in the affected eye. As this process continues, eventually less macular function occurs and ultimately good central vision is lost. Wet macular degeneration, on the other hand, is characterized by the abnormal growth of blood vessels from the vascular layer beneath the retina, underneath the macula, which ultimately begin to leak blood and fluid beneath the macula, causing severe disruption of the macular health. When this process begins, vision loss occurs relatively rapidly. And how does a person know which form they have? What is the first um, signal? Well, the first signal actually occurs in patients who have actually had the disease for some time. We grade macular de degeneration in early, intermediate, and late stage. Most people won't notice any part of their vision bothering them until they're somewhere in the intermediate stage. Okay, and at that point, are you talking about the dry form or the wet form? Talking about the dry form. Okay. The wet form really doesn't have these beginning and intermediate stages. It is in itself an end stage form of the disease. Okay, and how would you ever detect a beginning stage dry form a person with? Good question. The patient doesn't see anything. This is detected during a routine eye examination through a dilated pupil at your eye doctor. The first signs that we see are small yellow deposits underneath the retina called drusen. Hmm. And while scientists really are not sure how these drusen really affect macular function, we do know that an increase in the size and number of these drusen are precursors to macular degeneration that actually goes on to visual loss. Okay, and so that's the beginning stage, and then we talked about the intermediate stage, at mm -hmm. which point you might notice some effects on your own. Such as okay. blurred spots in your vision or needing better light to read by. And this like happens that. in both eyes at the same time, or? Not always. Actually, things usually happen in both eyes eventually, but quite often at quite different rates. So one could have uh, macular degeneration that's been going on for months or years, in one eye and not have anything in the companion eye. And when both eyes are open, 
the patient will never know that there's being a gradual vision, lo vision loss going on because the good eye will compensate. Oh, so it's quite often a patient will be in late stage dry form or have late stage before they even notice any effects. That can occur, yes, okay. that they get fairly far on down the road before they actually notice vision problems if they haven't been having regular eye exams. Okay, and we talked about age-related macular degeneration occurring in people over 60. So that's the first, that's when it starts to occur. How fast does it progress generally? Would you, how many years does it take oh, to get to? That's an excellent question. There really isn't a specific timeline from initial diagnosis until vision loss occurs, but we can say that in the dry form of the disease, it usually occurs gradually over a many year time frame. Okay. Whereas in the wet form of the disease, vision loss occurs relatively rapidly once that begins. Okay. And what it, happens in, excuse me. It, just in a matter of days or weeks. I mean, it's a very short time. Okay. And what happens to convert, for, what, what happens in the eye that um, converts a person's eye to, from dry or converts the macular degeneration from dry form to wet form? What happens in there? Well, let me first say that we can't predict who is going to convert from dry to wet macular degeneration. Not everyone does? Not everyone does. Okay. As a matter of fact, most people don't. Oh, interesting. Which is good, mm -hmm. but we don't know who's going to convert or when, but a conversion from dry to wet can happen at any stage during the course of the disease. Okay, and what happens in the eye? What would, what's the noticeable difference? Well, we found that in, through research that the eyes that have a problem with wet macular degen degeneration, or AMD, have, a, in, have an increased level of something called a growth factor that promotes the growth of abnormal cells. Okay. And these growth factors then just sort of draw up new blood vessels from the vascular layer, entice them to grow under the macula. So more blood vessels. And that's what. Yes. And what are there any treatments for the wet form of macular degeneration? Yes, there are. Uh, let me go back a few years. It wasn't that long ago that uh, the main way to treat these neovascular nets beneath the retina was with something called a thermal laser, which actually cauterized or burned the vessels to get them to stop leaking. Okay. Uh, that led to quite a scar in the retina, sure. but it preserved vision when it was successful. Later on, there was something called photodynamic therapy that was developed and is still employed in some cases today. But the real uh, new concept that's being employed and is very promising is something called anti-VEGF treatment. And the VEGF means vascular endothelial growth factor. So this compound, there are actually a couple of, of them that are being used clinically are actually injected into the eye, usually about once a month, until results are achieved. And these, as it implies, these anti-VEGF drugs then inhibit the growth factor from producing new fragile blood vessels. Great. So it slows the progress of the wet form. Right. Hopefully and, stops it. And hopefully stops it. Great. And bagging up to the dry form, are there treatments for the dry form? Well, the only treatment we have for the dry form is when it's caught in early to intermediate stage is the recommendation of certain uh, vitamin supplements, nutrition approaches. Uh, there was a study done that came out, a large study in 2001 called ARIDS, which stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. Okay. And that studied the effectiveness of certain antioxidant vitamins like A, C, and E, and the mineral zinc, on the, the, and their effect on maintaining macular health. So that was, it was determined through that that these dietary supplements can slow the progression of the dry form of the disease, although they are not really indicated in the early stage of the disease where they're only drusen, but only become effective if the person is progressing into intermediate disease. Okay, and are these um, supplements, are they available over the counter or are they available in foods that we could eat? Could we eat more of a certain type of food to get more of this in our diet to prevent that progress? 
Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, obviously, eating well is going to help. Eating things like leafy greens, spinach, uh, kale, collard greens, broccoli, these types of foods are rich in these antioxidant compounds. Of course, to get what you need to really save the macula once you're in the disease process, one would have to eat incredible volumes of these uh, of these foods, and I, I can't imagine any of us wanting to eat that much spinach <laughs> at a sitting, uh, <laughs> if any at all. So it's best to look at the vitamin supplements that supplements that have been formulated just for these conditions. So you get a prescription for such supplements? Actually, you should have the vitamins recommended by your eye doctor, and they, you can buy them over the counter. But one thing that should be noted is that there are high concentrations of certain elements and vitamins in these supplements, and there are, they are lacking in other nutri nutrients that people often need oh. that they get, say, in their normal daily multivitamin. So before going off and taking one of these vitamins just on your own, not only should you consult with your eye doctor, but also it's a good idea to consult with your family physician to see if you're going to be getting too much or too little of some of these elements. That's a good point. And um, what, another, another affliction I'm sure you see often in the same age group are cataracts. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Okay. And what age group does that affect? I shouldn't assume. Well, it's similar to the onset of when you'd expect to see early stage AMD um, after the age of 60 is a common time okay. where you would expect the formation of cataracts. And one question I forgot to ask you about macular degeneration. Is macular degeneration hereditary? To some extent, yes. Okay. We know that if you have an immediate family member, such as a parent or a sibling, that your risk of developing the disease is elevated. Okay, and what about cataracts? Is that, are you susceptible? Is everyone susceptible? Or are certain people more susceptible? Well, cataracts really are primarily a disease of aging. Okay. Uh, let me just talk about a cataract and how it forms sure. first. All of us are born with two lenses in our eyes, a crystalline lens that sits behind the pupil, behind the colored part of the eye. And when this lens functions normally, it is clear and it changes its shape. Mm -hmm. And that's what allows us to focus from far to near mm -hmm. at other distances. As this lens within the eye ages, the first thing we notice is that we can't focus up close like we used to. That's called middle age vision, bifocal vision, technically presbyopia. But after the lens goes through this aging process, then the next thing that it gives us problems with is blurring, clouding, uh, opacifications within that lens structure which lead to blurred vision. We just had a phone call asking what is astigmatism? Astigmatism, one hears this, this term a lot and people think it's some bad thing. Some people even think it's an eye disease. Really all it is is part of a refractive error of the eye in how it focuses light. Something that is in the large majority of eyeglass prescriptions. Okay. It's probably the most common defect of an eye is some astigmatism. And it just comes from an irregular curvature, usually of the cornea, the front of the eye. Mm -hmm. And as the light gets focused from the front of the eye to the back, then there's a distortion in that focus and lenses are designed to compensate for that. Thank you for answering our caller's question. Sure. Let's go back to the cataracts. So now we know physiologically what a cataract is, what kind of treatments are available. We know some of them from uh, the media and yeah. such, but what, what um, do you most commonly recommend for patients who have cataracts? Well, in early stages, uh, we follow the cataracts for a while until they get to the point where they disturb the patient's vision. Mm -hmm. And most cataracts are the age-related type. Uh, the most common one being nuclear sclerosis. It's just a term where the middle of the lens gets a little bit more dense and cloudy. And that goes on for some time. Early on in that process, vision can be rehabilitated quite successfully by just changing the eyeglass prescription oh. because the clouding effect is not so paramount at that point, but the swelling of the lens just changes the power of the lens. A new pair of glasses can clear the vision up quite nicely. But as it progresses then and gets cloudy and you can't achieve the vision you need 
or the division that makes you happy with glasses, then, of course, the thing to do is have cataract surgery, which is a very simple procedure. It's outpatient. Uh, it's probably one of the most common, if not the most common, operation performed in the United States, and it's highly successful. Great. Speaking of surgeries, I'd like to also ask you about LASIK surgery. Certainly that's, a, I'm sure, a question that you oh, sure. get all the time. I'm wondering about people who are approaching their middle ages and maybe in their early 40s to mid 40s and will almost certainly need a correction or reading glasses of some sort for mm -hmm. up close near, near vision activities. Sure. What would you recommend for somebody like that? Would you recommend them getting LASIK surgery for nearsightedness knowing that they might have another issue uh, in the that, works? <laughs> yeah, that's, that comes up all the time. Okay. Right, good question. First, let me just basically start by saying that LASIK has gotten to be a catch-all term for all refractive surgery, and it's only just one type of refractive surgery. Okay. Uh, we don't need to get into the specifics of LASIK, but it is where tissue is removed from the cornea, changes the focus of the eye that way. But uh, there are other procedures that are performed, some of them almost as commonly as LASIK. In consultation with your primary eye care doctor and your LASIK surgeon, what ultimately determines the type of procedure that one might have usually comes down to things like lifestyle, but more so the thickness of your cornea and the topography or shape of your cornea. Okay. Now back to your question about would it be good for someone who is, say, the bifocal age to have this. Well, it's fine. They can have it. Let's take for, uh, and see just fine at a distance. Let's take as an example the most common profile patient that has refractive surgery, a moderately nearsighted person. Mm -hmm. Wears glasses to see at a distance. The glasses aren't too thick, not too thin, but, you know, they just have that vision loss to the point where they need the glasses to walk across the room and they put them on when they get up in the morning. This is the kind of patient that really is ideally suited and likes the procedure. Now, once the eyes get to the point of the bifocal age, as you alluded to, when the refractive procedure is performed, that essentially takes that glasses prescription and sort of just puts it into the eye. So now the distance vision is clear. However, if you needed bifocals before, now you need to put on reading glasses. Right. So you've essentially traded using glasses from one distance to another. Right. And of course you've taken away that ability to lie in bed and read at night if you're a nearsighted person by just taking your glasses off and your vision here is just fine. Okay. So the, the individual has to think about how much of the time he or she is going to be reading, doing close work, how much of the time they drive or do water sports or other outdoor activities and take that into account before you decide if you want to actually do the refractive procedure. And do you see anything in the pipeline as far as refractive procedures are concerned that might aid someone in that situation with both vision correction, with correcting both their nearsightedness and their farsightedness? Is there anything out there that's, that they're working on They're working regard? on new refractive surgery techniques all the time. Uh, one procedure that's still fairly experimental that being, being done in some research institutions now uh, is something called an accommodating IOL, an IOL meaning intraocular lens, mm -hmm. which is an implant similar to what gets put in the eye after just a standard cataract surgery. But these are designed so that as the eye changes its shape or tries to change shape through various mechanisms when looking from far to near, there's just enough pressure applied to the edges and the connections of that of that lens that they can get some focus resembling what used to happen prior to age 40. But it has a long way to go. Sure, it'll be exciting to watch and there are see lots what of things happens. Going on. Yeah. Neat. Neat. I also wanted to talk about protection. How can we protect our eyes from uh, the sun and chlorine or chemicals of any sort? What do you recommend? Well, how to best protect them, I best should Best protect them. Yes. Well, now that we're in the summer months, I suppose we could talk about what to do about extra exposure to sunlight. Sure. Uh, that's a big factor because too much sunlight has long been known to contribute to cataract formation and now as well macular degeneration. Uh, good quality sunglasses, uh, whenever one is out in the elements, direct sunlight, say the 10 to 2 
time when one is not supposed to be sunbathing, for example. Those are the worst times. You should have on good quality sunglasses. What do you mean by good quality well, sunglasses? Sunglasses that, <coughs> that protect the eye from ideally 100% of UV radiation. Okay. And of those sunglasses, the wraparound designs are actually better than the straight across designs, just keeping more light out of the eyes that way. And also, it doesn't hurt to use a visor or a brimmed cap, especially if someone's out on the tennis court all day. Uh, or at the beach. Sure. You can help with that as well. And what do you recommend for young children who might not be as good about compliance as we would be? <laughs> well, I don't know what you would use, the average mother would do to get their child to keep the sunglasses <laughs> on at the wading pool, but uh, whatever positive reinforcement techniques you can use to <laughs> no. get them to do no, what but do you recommend them to, them to use sunglasses at a young age even? Yeah, because the effects of ultraviolet light are cumulative over your lifetime. So don't be afraid to get that toddler at the wading pool uh, done up in some good sunglasses. They can be found readily enough. And uh, don't keep them out there too long. Sure. What about time. people who are exposed to chlorine or exposed to, uh, who are swimmers maybe, or exposed to other sorts of chemicals all the time? What do you recommend for them? Are lubricants available or what do you recommend? What well, are you talking about? People who get swimming pool water in their eyes, sure. swimmers at the Y, kids. Sure. Uh, actually, or the, swimmers on swim team. Exactly. Well, swimmers on swim teams, competitive swimmers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you watched the Olympics last summer or any Y meet, you know that people who are really swimmers will use swimmers goggles, which is the ideal thing. Just keep the water out of the eyes. But just for kids, you know, frolicking around in the pool, in the municipal pool in the summer. They're going to get water in their eyes, they're going to be chlorine, and sure. the eyes will get red, but the eyes will clear themselves naturally after two or three hours from getting out of the water. Of course, if you want to use lubricants for comfort or a get the red out eye drop, that will hasten the return to white, but it's really not necessary. Okay, so back to the, what, in a normal day, what, are, what do you see patients for the most? What do you hear? What is the majority of your patient? <laughs> of, oh, what are the... What are the things that we yes. see most commonly yes. in the office? Well, of course, uh, by far the most common thing is refractive air, sure. farsightedness, nearsightedness, astigmatism. Okay. And can we has you have you seen that change in the last 10 years any? Uh, have you seen it change due to computer more computer use or more screen time as people put it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the theory about overuse of the eyes at near and the accommodation of the lens in the eye, especially during the developmental years, that's been studied for decades and decades, and there are certain studies will support that. Others say, well, maybe not, but uh, it is a well-known fact that someone can be at the age where we think they're done uh, changing in terms of nearsightedness, and they'll be out of college, but then they'll decide to go to law school or be a CPA, and two or three years down the road, their nearsightedness has increased by a significant degree. So there really is something to, uh, and we're in, n not everyone's in agreement as to the exact mechanism as to how this happens. There have been a lot of theories over the years, but a good question. There is an association there. So what can we do to protect ourselves or to uh, decrease our risks or to manage our risk factors for macular degeneration and cataracts, since those are two of the most common things that could affect us in, in our lives? Well, yeah, there are obviously things that we can do to keep our bodies healthy that will also keep our eyes healthy. Exercise, eat healthy, keep your weight down, keep a normal blood pressure, use good sunglasses when out in sunlight. Uh, risk factors specifically for macular degeneration are many. Of course, aging is a big one. Sure. Smoking is very big. There was a study done not too long ago in Britain that indicated that Smoking actually almost doubles one's chance of getting wow. wet macular degeneration in his or her lifetime. Wow. Um, nutrition, of course, we talked about that, uh, the antioxidants that provide protection to cells from free radicals, which we don't need to get in how they operate, but the free radicals in our system can damage cells and lead to things like cancer and, and other systemic diseases. So the vitamin thing, the nutrition thing is big. Eat a diet with leafy green vegetables as often as you can. Spinach, broccoli, don't be afraid of those things. And protect Fish, your sun. Fish, eggs, 
protect mm -hmm. your eyes from sun. Right. And, the and other things that contribute uh, to eye disease, particularly AMD, hypertension or high blood pressure. Uh, obviously, this damages small blood vessels in the body everywhere. The eye is no exception. And since these very small blood vessels in the eye are responsible for providing nutrients in and out of the eye, if they're not functioning properly, the eye won't stay as healthy as it needs to be. Yes. Obesity is also another factor. Uh, one study uh, that I know of indicated that obesity tends to promote the progression of dry macular degeneration at a faster rate hmm. from beginning to vision loss. And uh, eating things like cookies and, and potato chips, junk food, these things, uh, some studies have shown, will definitely increase one's risk of wet AMD. I can imagine. Also, uh, just to throw in another couple things in, uh, race is a factor uh, for risk. Uh, macular degeneration is almost exclusively a disease of Caucasians or whites. Hmm. And also, uh, within that subset, gender, females are more prone to develop it. And people with lighter skin, lighter complexion, bluer eyes are also more at risk. Due to the p lack of pigment? Right. There seems to be somewhat of a protective effect with the amount of pigment in the eye. Mm -hmm. And you can generalize that if someone has more skin pigmentation, then the pigment layer underneath the retina has a little thicker pigment as well, and that can lend protection to the eye. Thank you. That concludes our segment for tonight. And Dr. Middlebrook, I thank you for joining us and enlightening us with your expertise on eye health. Thank you for joining us tonight on Health Connections. To see this episode and others, go to ksmq.org and click on Health Connections. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Health Connections. Have a good night.